if this little nation goes down the drain and can't maintain her independence, ask yourself what's going to happen to all the other little nations. The uh, canal is perpendicular to the one you're attacking now. They have on black uniforms. Now, estimate approximately 3-0. Do you have them inside, over? Uh, this is 2-3, Roger. We have them inside. Uh, we're engaged at present time. At the beginning of each quarter century, NMMI saw its cadets fighting in a war. In 1967, America was waging war in Vietnam. The first cadet killed was helicopter pilot Captain Francis D. de Amaral, 55, senior college of the 1st Cavalry. Lieutenant Robert C. L. Ferguson, 62, high school, was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. 29 cadets lost their lives in Southeast Asia, while Americans at home clashed among themselves over our military involvement over there. To many, the military had lost its appeal, but Institute Superintendent General Sam Agee would repeatedly say, academics will be paramount, but the school is military and will be run like one. The Institute would soon leave behind the glory years of great sports teams and capacity enrollment. Roger Staubach would give Bronco football coach Bob Shaw a great deal of credit for his quarterbacking skills and success with the Dallas Cowboys. The college football team of 59 went undefeated. High school football won two state championships in 63 and 65. The 60s would prove to be one of NMMI's greatest decades as a sports powerhouse. Colonel Pappy Gratton, the longest tenured faculty member serving from 1927 to 1966, retired. Colonel Ted Hunt retired as the first alumni secretary, ending his 50 years of service to NMMI. Colonel Joe Pose and his wife Ruby both retired after a combined service of 68 years. General Agee firmly planted his seal on the Institute, stressing the honor code and academic improvements. As dark clouds rolled in at the beginning of the 70s, many things changed. Full enrollment, a simple blue book, and parades every Sunday at four. After some decline, enrollment collapsed in 1970, eventually causing the closure of Saunders Barracks. The decline was blamed on two factors. They were the national anti-military environment and the absence of an internal cohesion sufficient to manage recruiting. The chapel fund drive, headed by Babe Godfrey, not only raised nearly a million dollars, but Babe's devotion kept the Institute needs in front of thousands of alumni. Colonel Robert Schultz replaced Colonel Vaughn as Commandant, staying only two years. Colonel Doc Blanchard replaced Schultz, but he too stayed two years. General Agee left in 1971 after eight years of dedicated service. The Regents appointed Colonel Buck Wiles superintendent former PMS, a 1932 graduate, to hold things together until a new superintendent could be found. In 1971 and 1972, the dark clouds hung low over NMMI. Enrollment continued to drop, but the foundation of a great school would weather the turmoil. An admissions office was started. The regents officially named Wiles superintendent at the close of 72. In February of 1972, the regents selected a superintendent. Colonel Robert Kemble. Regent Chairman Homer Glover called him both a scholar and a soldier, the ideal combination for NMMI. A World War II veteran who had fought at the Battle of the Bulge, Colonel Kemble went on to graduate from West Point in 1949. He later took an MA in literature from the University of Pennsylvania and a PhD from George Washington University in American Thought and Civilization. He had graduated from Army Command and General Staff School and had been head of the National War College Advanced Research Group, as well as Director of American Studies at West Point. Colonel Kemble had published an annotated edition of the great American poem, John Brown's Body, as well as a book called The Image of the Army Officer in America. The school welcomed Superintendent Kemble as a man who understood the academic military dynamic. His credentials as a soldier and as a scholar were invaluable to NMMI, as were the unimposing yet calmly assertive aspects of his personality. Using his powers of logic and articulation, Superintendent Kemble quietly convinced many cadets, faculty, staff, and alumni of the wisdom of his ways, calling for a clear-eyed vision, an undaunted drive. He asked the Institute to take an objective look at itself he asked the alumni to concern itself more with the impact of greater scholastic demands upon the Corps, stating, no old cadet 
at least in his less emotional and more rational moments, has ever believed that NMMI should stand still. Failure to adjust is stagnation, and stagnation is truly the prophetic kiss of death. Periodically, some new dimension must be added, and some historical relics must be discarded. Colonel Kemble assured the school that NMMI would again be fiscally sound with increased enrollment. Stressing leadership through example and pride, Superintendent Kemble, through the Commandant, Colonel George Robbins, created the positions of two Deputy Commandants, one for high school and one for college. The next few years saw several personnel changes. Dean Ward, who had taken NMMI's curriculum to the Roswell community, resigned. And Dr. David Cothran replaced him as academic dean. Doc Blanchard, the commandant who had refined procedures dealing with the drugs and alcohol problem and had streamlined the demerit system, also resigned. He was replaced by Colonel George Robbins, a former cadet at Brown Military Academy and respected senior advisor in Vietnam. The commandant's office also lost the service of Tom Matchin, a second-generation cadet during the early 30s who had spent many years at NMMI in a variety of capacities. Colonel Seth O'Rell, class of 25, a TAC and eventually chemistry teacher, retired after 49 years on the Hill. Colonel Buck Wiles, former acting superintendent and able assistant to Superintendent Kemble, retired in May of 73. There were new positions added in advising, one high school and one college. That year, Chaplain Vern Edmondson brought his firm, friendly advice to be generously shared for 15 years with many cadets and staff as well. Free from Kant and religious cliches, Chaplain Edmondson's prayers usually left a smile on the faces of his listeners. Within the Corps, Bronco belt buckles were back, and white jackets were worn on formal occasions, as were white military shirts and shoulder boards. The NMMI Mounted Color Guard paraded in red and black uniforms, and advanced ROTC cadets wore black berets. The stoops were ornamented with new red bathrobes. And so, while the tower clock continued to ring and the carillons continued to play, at NMMI, times were changing. In August of 1974, 828 cadets enrolled. By the next year, a capacity enrollment of 929. That year, the Alumni Chapel was dedicated and the development office was established. Events expressed the new optimism at NMMI. 7,500 alumni and 2,500 patrons had donated for the construction of the campus's non-denominational chapel. Within a year, the chairman of the new development program, General Sam Goodwin, reported to the board that the school had received $1.2 million in deferred gifts. This optimism was also seen in the form of monies appropriated to refurbish the stables and to construct the Glover Computer Center. Revenue bond money to the tune of $2 million was also set aside to refurbish Hagerman Barracks. By the nation's bicentennial, a new spirit invigorated New Mexico Military Institute. Of this spirit, Superintendent Kemble stated, it is difficult not to be effusively and perhaps unwarrantedly positive. We need to recognize, however, that this untempered sanguinity can allow us to lose sight too quickly of NMMI's less fortunate days of the past. The health of educational institutions these days is too fragile and the potential impact of unknown factors too unpredictable to suggest easy complacency and smug professional immobility. Superintendent Kemble, maintaining that academic excellence was the keystone of the Institute, restored the school's commitment to a college prep curriculum. In late 1975, New Mexico Attorney General Tony Anaya published his opinion that NMMI's exclusion of females from the Corps violated New Mexico's Equal Rights Amendment. During the next year, Superintendent Kemble and Commandant Robbins visited with comparable institutions, and in 1976 appeared before the Regents with their conclusions. One, NMMI should admit females. Two, the state should help defray transitional costs. Three, the admittance of females should not alter the Corps in any way. On what one regent called a sad day indeed, the board voted to admit females to the school by the fall of 1978, but proposed a legislative amendment banning them. Fearing females would have permanent harmful effects with the purposes, goals, and traditions of NMMI, and fearing females would not be able to participate in military discipline, most alumni supported the region's proposed amendment to exclude them from the Corps. 
cadets expressed their outrage, fearing that Saunders Barracks would be transformed into a girls' dormitory. The regimental staff at Homecoming 76 expressed their chagrin by welcoming alumni to the last all-male homecoming in NMMI history. State hearings were held. The State Central Committee of the Democratic Party opposed the amendment, which excluded females from the Corps. Mrs. Jean Lujan, wife of Congressman Lujan, spoke out in support of an all-male Corps, while retired WAC Colonel Margaret Johnson drew cheers when she proclaimed her support of female attendance. Representatives from the Student Union and ROTC students at the University of New Mexico urged defeat of the amendment, calling it a blatant act of discrimination. After having passed in the Senate, the bill, sponsored by R.E. Thompson, failed in the House. Colonel Ed Porter, alumni director and pup tent editor, wrote, The battle was fought. Now is the time to heal wounds and work together to integrate females. Further negativism will only demonstrate lack of confidence in the system. With cameras clicking and newspaper persons reporting, August 21st, 1978, saw 28 females arrive on NMMI campus. And the world did not end. As a matter of fact, adjustment to females went rather smoothly. Those fears of physical abuse, endless litigation, loss of reputation were all unfounded. Oh, some of the male cadets cried reverse discrimination when the first females were housed in the newly furnished quarters of JRT, claiming the barracks never looked so good. But by and large, integration went well. Some females took an I belong here and I'll be damned if you can show otherwise attitude. The females competed and proved themselves in a variety of ways. In 1980, cadet Laurie Murphy became the first female to earn distinguished military student honor. Many would follow. In 1980, the women's tennis team competed successfully at nationals. In 1980, a cadet was homecoming queen. She was Tracy Daniel, a Roswell cadet, the first of many cadets to grace the courts of homecomings and final balls. In 1981, after receiving her commission in the U.S. Army, cadet Laquita Hamilton, a black woman from Milwaukee, spoke as valedictorian. Less than 20 years before, NMMI would have denied her admission on two counts. But after two decades of change and adjustment, the Institute recognized her as one of its finest. In 1983, Leah Bernard became the first college female to let her in a male sport, soccer. Jennifer Reed, another campus beauty and athlete, lettered in baseball. Superintendent Campbell and Commandant George Robbins, perhaps two of the Institute's finest leaders, left the Institute in January of 1977. Dean David Cothran was named acting superintendent. For the first time in Institute history, the faculty was involved on the screening committee to select a new superintendent. In April 1977, the Regents named Brigadier General Gerald Childress the 14th superintendent. Brigadier General Gerald Childress, age 46, had earned a BS from Virginia Tech University and an MA from George Washington University. He'd been a battalion commander in Vietnam and director of the advertising and information branch of the ROTC. He had known of the Institute firsthand by being ROTC commander of the 3rd Division. In the same year, a new dean, Dr. Alex Sanchez, was named, and one of his first acts was to establish the Student Assistance Center. Superintendent Childress would give the campus a dramatic facelift and increase alumni donations. Under his stewardship, NMMI would see the dedication of Godfrey Athletic Center, the Tolls Learning Center, a complete TV production studio donated by alumnus Jeep Daniels, the McBride Museum, and the Brown Music Annex. It would see the transformation of streets into paved gray brick walkways. Three plazas would grace campus. The Bronco Plaza with its historic bronze Bronco, Saunders Plaza with the stately Colonel of Bronze watching over all his cadets, and the DeSanders Alumni Plaza featuring life-size bronze sculptures depicting those who had died in the four major American wars of the 20th century, framed by 50 flagpoles and rayed by the Zia Sun symbol in its center, with names of every alumnus etched in marble. While financial aid to schools decreased during the President Reagan years, the Parents Club, the Alumni Association, and the Development Office brought to NMMI unprecedented donations. The NMMI Foundation and Alumni Association 
contributed over $2 million for scholarships. On a more personal level, the Childresses hosted annual hamburger balls, backyard cookouts for cadets, staff, and faculty and families. A Los Alamos physicist and a West Point graduate, Dr. Robert Wagner, was named the new dean in 1980. A new bandmaster, former cadet Mike Donovan, picked up the tempo of the NMMI band. With financial assistance from the foundation, parents club, and alumni, the band travels widely and has become one of the greatest publicity agents for the school. They represented the state of New Mexico in President George Bush's inaugural parade. As a troop, headquarters has taken Harry Morrison more than any other troop. With enrollment stabilizing, ROTC program flourishing, and scholarships increasing, the Institute strengthened its traditional role as a high school, junior college boarding school, and eliminated evening classes and adult education. In 1980, the North Central Association recommended the Institute become the state's first exclusively college prep high school. College requirements also tightened. Remedial classes could not count toward graduation. The state's education reform movement and Senate Bill 106 imposed about 25% more academic work on high school cadets than their fathers and grandfathers. But cadets still managed to have fun, not counting the two infamous streaks of 1983 and 84. There are annual mustache contests, casino night, dances, and movies and entertainers. With a lot of imagination and a few bikinis, they celebrated Malibu Beach Day in the middle of Hagerman Barracks, filled with sand, frisbees, and lots of loud rock and roll. In April 1982, friends, cadets, and countrymen began participating in Shakespeare festivals, an annual event now. Twice a year, there is state night for cadets from the same home state. There is the first sergeant's Christmas dinner, chapel service, and in February, the ring dance. The Maverick staff publishes three times a year, including the Pink Maverick of February, filled with love poems written by cadets, staff, and faculty. The Valentine Maverick isn't the only thing pink around the campus. In 1978, cadet officers donned pink pants, bringing back even more history. Two years later, there were new dress blues instead of army greens. On the playing field, cadets continue to excel, even with the demise of Bronco football in 82. During 1976-77, Japan's junior tennis champ, Suyoshi Fukui, played for NMMI. Needless to say, the Broncos dominated the junior college play. In 81, Richard McCandless won two state championships in wrestling, first time ever for a cadet. He was also his class's valedictorian. Bronco Goff in 83 had a particularly fine season with players from Scotland and Scandinavia. Orienteering and karate are campus favorites. The Chinese Olympic basketball team played the Broncos to a packed house at Cahoon Armory. Good training for the Broncos, who went on to win 23 games. To honor alumni athletes, Dallas Cowboy Roger Staubach and Jim Honachek, American League umpire, were inducted into the Hall of Fame. In all, more than 50 cadets have been All-American. The Institute is nationally acclaimed for its military excellence in passing annual inspections with highest marks. In our military tradition, Homecoming 84 gave honorary junior college diplomas to former cadets from the class of 44. Those men had been called to the service in World War II before they could graduate. Homecoming 86 honored those men of New Mexico's 200th Coastal Artillery who had endured the Bataan Death March. During the Childress years, the Corps learned to toe the line under Commandants Jock Brownfield, Chuck Hansen, and now Lieutenant Colonel Seth O'Rell. Dr. Joe Tusso, an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel and old English scholar, assumed the deanship and chose as his assistant Dean Charla Featherstone, NMMI's first female high school principal. General Childress had expressed his intention of remaining at NMMI to celebrate its centennial. However, the state of New Mexico questioned the financial management of the institute. State auditors revealed questionable practices and with pressure from Santa Fe, General Childress resigned in 1989, indicating he wanted to avoid further negative publicity. The deputy superintendent, Colonel Don Stewart, graduate of NMMI's junior and senior college, served as the school's 15th superintendent, while a search committee sought a permanent superintendent. In May 1990, the Board of Regents announced their selection of 16th superintendent of New Mexico Military Institute, Lieutenant General Winfield W. Scott, Jr. 
a West Point graduate receiving a B.S. and M.S., Superintendent Scott also earned an M.A. degree in international law from the Catholic University of America. He completed the Armed Forces Staff College and the Naval War College programs in 1964 and 1967. A command pilot with more than 5,300 flying hours in more than 25 aircraft, serving in South Korea and in Vietnam, Superintendent Scott won Top Gun in the Pacific Air Force Fighter Weapons Meet. He was Chief of the Tactical Air Control Center, Deputy Director of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the 10th Superintendent of the Air Force Academy. Parents of six children, General Scott and his wife Sally, expressed their delight at now being involved with the education of youth. At homecoming 1986, NMMI launched the Centennial Campaign, organized by Ed Julian and Bill Wiles. Immediately successful in meeting its projected $8 million goal and raising another $4 million over the next few years. This money will go toward financing faculty professorships, distinguished professorships, of which alumnus Professor Frank H.H. H. King, Professor Emeritus of the University of Hong Kong, holds the first. The money will also go toward cadet scholarships and centennial celebration events to include a lecture series of 16 speakers during the 1990-91 school year, the academic convocation of September 1991, the special birthday cake and dinners, the nationally acclaimed speakers for homecoming and graduation, and in January 1991, the torch run and the lighting of the centennial flame at the north end of the Bronco Plaza. The torch, like the school itself, stands as a light guiding young men and women to achieve their fullest. The torch was lighted in Santa Fe and carried by runners through the state of New Mexico, just as those many, many individuals have carried the torch of excellence through NMMI history. And so that school up on the hill, the Institute, closes its first 100 years with over 20,000 alumni, a strong sense of tradition, and a heritage that has seen her boys die in four wars and receive valor decorations for bravery on the battlefield. Other cadets went on to Captain America's largest industries, care for the sick, or solve national problems. Each cadet, inspired by a proven sense of duty, honor, and achievement, has gone on in some way to make a mark on our world in which we live. Behind them are those men and women that provided the special magic for the faculty and staff. Whether it was the success of Luigi Martini Mancini at the turn of the century, or Cap Brown, Myrtle Decker, Radebush, or today's Lovelace or Gibbs. As NMMI moves into the next century, it does so on the firm foundation built by the leaders of yesterday, and firmed by the commitment to education and building tomorrow's leaders today. That's quite a history, one that all of us associated with NMMI are proud of. Now you can see why ex-cadets talk about the Institute not as a school or a place, but as something that's part of their lives. All of us come and go. Let's hope the Institute goes on forever. I'm Sam Donaldson.